quick introduction and then I'm going to let Charlene talk about herself a little bit more. Um, I met Charlene through my work with Own the Podium. She was a mental performance consultant with uh, Cross Country at the time and I believe is still working with them. And I think the thing that impressed me with Charlene was that she worked with and through the coaches um, to support the athletes but also the coaches as well in their work and so was really key in I guess providing a, a great team environment uh, for them to work with and through the athletes and, and really showed a lot of um, support and concern for the coaches so I think that's kind of where we're heading with today's uh, webinar and uh, so Charlene I will let you take over and talk and I'm not sure how I can do I, I'll, can you hit your video on there and people can look at you? There, I think that's it. Good. Perfect. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Teresa, for inviting me to be part of this um, mentorship uh, webinar uh, today. Um, I am very passionate about uh, working with high performance clients, whether they be athletes, coaches, or support staff. I very much believe in the team environment. Um, we're, we're better together than we are as individuals is certainly my philosophy. So I think what I'll do before we begin is I'll, I like to always just sort of set the context for my remarks and, and the best way I know how to do that is just to share a little bit about myself, where I come from and um, what my philosophy is towards what I do. So, um, my background is in figure skating. Um, I grew up through the Canadian Figure Skating Association and, and really achieved about a junior national team status. Um, since the time I was really, I guess, six years old, when you know your parents start to collect the what am I going to do when I grow up page for each grade, um, it, it, it started in kindergarten and I, all the way through to grade 12, I wanted to be a figure skating coach. So becoming a mental performance consultant wasn't really the plan. Um, the plan was to be a, a, a really, really great coach. And, and I knew that to be a great coach, I needed to get some education. And so I started into this uh, program of kinesiology, uh, sports science, trying to learn more about sports science so I could be the best coach I could be. And along the way, I decided probably about my third year at, uh, in my undergrad was that I, I no longer really had the desire to get up and be on the ice at 4.30 in the morning. And I thought, I really don't think I could do that for the rest of my life, not knowing that I actually do st still get up at about 5 o'clock and start my day, um, even as an adult now. But at the time, so I started pursuing um, different sports sciences and fell in love with, with sports psychology. I have three degrees in sport and exercise psychology, including my PhD. And um, so true to my heart then is that I come to this as a sports scientist first uh, with a deep passion for coaching. Um, so that's how I really see myself. I, I have obviously some training in psychology um, as a counselor, but that is not my, my expertise. Um, so as a sports scientist, with a specialty in sport and exercise psychology, I really see myself as a coach of training the mind. And um, that's why my title is a mental performance consultant. And across Canada, we've become better at distinguishing between uh, folks who are trained just like me, more in terms of sport science and, and interested in coaching the mind, uh, rather than counselors and clinicians who are trained really more from a medicine uh, perspective where the philosophy is to look for problems and solve issues, mental mental performance issues type of thing. So I just really see strengths and weaknesses and I want to I want to capitalize on as many strengths as possible. Um, Teresa, I don't know, do you have do you have uh, control of that? Yeah, okay. Um, so um, my first job out of school was to be an academic professor and I did achieve tenure and promotion and, and was in academia for about 10 years. I still try and keep an active uh, research um, program going. I, I still do some research on the side. So again, I come from this with a sort of a really evidence-based science approach. Um, 
and 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 think that I'm a better practitioner because I ha my hand isn't in the research. Um, so those are, I guess, some of the details that I I think are important. Um, for the last, I guess I I should also probably mention. Sorry, it feels like it's a bit scattered. Maybe it's because I don't have my slide in front of me. Um, I'm so in tune to to speaking when I have my slides. Um, I have been doing this for about 20 years now. I can't believe it's been that long, but it apparently has been according to the, the time clock. I've been working with elite level athletes um, since about 2006. I was integrated into the sport science, or sorry, the Canadian Sport Institute around 2010, just after the Vancouver Olympics. And I've been working with cross country skiing, swimming, triathlon and mountain biking is sort of my core sports. So um, that's a little bit about where I am and where I'm coming from. Um, I think now that I see the slides are up, I can um, I can use the slides. Is that, do I have control over the slides, Teresa? You should, I think. Do you? Good. Um, I don't yes. know. We'll try it out. It looks like I do, so we'll, we'll give it a go. So, um, I originally titled my talk today, The Coach as the Performer, of course, because I do believe that you are an integral part of any athlete's success. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But then I was thinking, well, what am I, what am I really going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to go to sort of the, the expertise that I have and that sort of emotion regulation and performance. And so I wanted to retitle it maybe Thriving Under Pressure. And then I was thinking some more, and I was actually at a swimming conference this past weekend speaking to some coaches there. And one of the athletes astutely went asked, what is the best thing my coach could do for me in the Olympic environment? And that athlete said, just be Kylie. Um, and that was her coach's name. Um, and so they really appreciated coaches who just were themselves, whether they were in the highest performing environment or not, they just appreciated the person being who they were and consistent with their behavior. So I thought, now that's the perfect title um, for, for this talk today is really going to be about being yourself. So um, your names are not Kylie, obviously, so you can insert your own name in there, but that's what this, this talk today is really about, is to how to be yourself in all conditions, whether it's stressful or not. So it's going to be helpful for us to, to start today um, by maybe just a few introductions yourself. Um, I, I, can they turn on their mics and talk? Is that possible? I can, yeah, I can switch it over to a discussion mode. Oh, okay, that would be great. Okay, so conference mode has been changed. So just, we can test if, just say hello if, <laughs> if you can. I think I've got, let's see, we've got Claire Meadows, Claire Mitten, Delaney, Leah, Megan. Of other names. I think what you'll need to do is turn on your microphones. Hi. Hello. Okay. We've got Mel, Mike. Delaney's on. Okay, so we're, we're there. But what you'll need to do is, um, Claire Mitten, microphone doesn't work. So you'll need to, um, if you want to, say something, turn on your your microphone at that time, if you can just put it on mute for now, otherwise it picks up a lot of background noise and that, but. Okay, so so the question I'm gonna pose, and, and you can feel free to jump in at any time, really, is I'm just interested in sort of what your name is, what sport are you with, and maybe present one or two challenges that you face as a coach but I'd like you to do so in the words of your athletes. So it's going to be a little bit of third person, as if you know your athletes know what you, you cope with today. But uh, it's going to be sort of, let's try and use their words to describe some of your challenges. So I'll just kind of let this go free flow for the next couple of minutes here and see you know, if we can get a couple of voices in here just 
introducing themselves. Hmm. Okay, it looks like there's a couple microphones going, but I'm not sure what's going on. Do we have a whiteboard? Uh, Maybe we, we can we do. Can check it out. Um, oh man, I'm sorry, this is not my strength. Okay. Mm, here we go. There we go. We've got a little bit of a whiteboard. I think you do you have it? I have the whiteboard. Okay. So if you just tap the pencil, I think you can. Or maybe text. Yeah, that probably is better. Okay. So I guess we're not hearing any I'm seeing people trying to talk, but So you can just maybe type on the, the whiteboard there and introduce yourself, maybe your sport, and then maybe one issue or one challenge that you're facing. See if we can get a few on the board. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on here, Shirley. Maybe if people could type it into the chat. Uh, that works too. Leah says, I would uh, say emotionally uh, slash frustration during travel is something my athletes would recognize. Okay. Emotionality, sorry, slash frustration. Okay, perfect. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, oh, okay. Delaney, you're on. Okay, right, sure. Well, I'll just introduce myself. Obviously, I'm Delaney. Um, I work with Hockey Canada um, with our under-18 national team program, and I also coach at the Okanagan Hockey Academy in Penticton. And I guess one of the challenges that, uh, that I have is with the athletes, that I guess, speaking through their words, would be balancing over coaching with allowing them to kind of develop on their own at times. Like I feel like I had a lot to teach and I want to teach, but sometimes I just gotta let them play it out. Excellent. Thank you, Delaney. Anyone else either type in the chat or can't seem to get microphones going. So. Okay. Maybe we can go back to the presentation as well. <laughs> uh, where are we? I you if I just press this. There we go. Uh, there. Okay. Okay, well, we're not going to get ourselves too frustrated with just working with the, um, the platform here today. So even just taking the moment to reflect on these questions, you know, what does your athlete say about you? Often what they say about you is because of your outward behavior. So for most of us, it's really tricky to 
hide our emotions, hide our stress. It comes through in lots and lots of different ways. And here's just a few questions to consider because this is how our athletes and those that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis would know about us. My experience is that the coach is a critical element for athletes' behavior and performance at the very highest levels. And in fact, the research will corroborate that observation of mine, that some of the greatest predictions about athlete performance is in the relationship that they hold with their coaches. So being yourself, Kylie, if that, you know, obviously your name's not Kylie, but being Delaney is critical for assisting your athletes in their performance. So I, I'm just going to invite you for the next, I guess, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, to just really think about this time as your time to um, be your best as a performer, as a partnership for your athletes. So in this slide, what I wanted to get across is that the sports science literature is pretty clear on this, and there's a lot of investigation, particularly in the last four or five years, that the profession of coaching is indeed stressful. And one of the reasons why it is stressful is because you wear a lot of different hats. And, and on the left-hand side of the slide, I try and get at just as many roles and responsibilities as, uh, as a coach would it experience and these are not all of the roles and responsibilities of course but they are a lot of them from instructor mentor friend sports scientist an organizer educator counselor and i'm sure that you can think of it. the other reason why coaching is a stressful profession is because your value and your success as a coach is often determined by outcomes that you can't ultimately control. And here again, you can see when I gave this presentation to some swimming coaches, I used the swimming as an example here, but it's often tied to the outcome of the athlete's performance. And of course, while you play a part of that, you aren't the one actually out there performing. And so that becomes stressful because you can't control all of that aspect of your job performance. The stress that you feel is, is often a double-edged sword. Um, on one hand, there's a lot of thought and attention to helping protect coaches from burning out, from overheating, uh, and, and from ultimately withdrawing and leaving the profession. And that's on the left-hand side of our, of our uh, slide there. But more recent research, and certainly it has been my personal experience, is that the stress doesn't have to come at such a great cost of, of our health and burning out and leaving our profession that we are passionate about, but rather it can enhance our performance in that environment and that it, it helps us create decisions and make decisions that are bang on right in the center that is ultimately going to enhance and help deliver performance. So, so stress isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we have to just recognize our response into stress and how we can best utilize this energy source uh, in the activities that we do. So I just wanted to include this slide here to put a variety of different studies um, that have been developed and shown and of course I've given you one of these as one of your readings um, uh, in preparation for this webinar but there's a there's a really good group of studies here done by Dr. Peter Alsoga and he and his team of uh, Joanne Butt, Ian Maynard and Kate Hayes have, have done a series of studies over the last five years that really look at the elite environment and the coaching within elite environment. And the, the relevance of these studies is that 
it really helps to prepare us for the level of um, personal awareness that we need as coaches to really excel in those environments. And so um, I'm just kind of going to highlight those studies on this slide here. I really want to take a bit of time and help us understand that the way that we experience our stress isn't necessarily our fault. Um, to much extent, it's because we're hardwired in a certain fashion, and that is why we respond the way we do. And I've recommended this book to a couple of different coaches that I've worked with, and the reviews on the book have actually been quite poor. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read this the Chimp Paradox by Dr. Stephen Peters, and it was published in 2012. Um, it is quite an informative book, and I think its, um, it's messaging is, is bang on and easy to digest, um, but it's, it's actually not too palatable in a written form. So I thought what we could do is actually watch the video of uh, Dr. Peters' TED Talk explaining this uh, concept of how our brain functions under pressure. So this would be great if we can queue it up. I don't know, Teresa, if we could queue up the video. Okay, so I'm gonna open YouTube and try and get the address off of the... Perfect. Um, just a minute, I gotta go back into... And, I, and while Teresa's... Uh, bringing up this video, I just actually really want to encourage you to write any comments or questions that you have along the way in the chat box. Um, it will be really helpful to help me enable your learning um, or address and, and be more specific in my comments if, if you respond in the chat box. I did post this video earlier for, for people to watch. I don't know if everyone got a chance to watch it. Um, I don't know uh, how you are, but um, when, I, when I find really good stuff, I often watch it multiple times. So I hope you'll indulge me, if you have watched it already, to watch it again. Um, I tend to pick up different things every time I watch these little can videos. You, um, just Charlene, so can I, you see the, the screen here? No, I can't see that. Oh, yet. okay. Um, which one is it? Laney, thank you for your comments. I'm glad you also enjoyed this this little uh, video. <laughs> I'm with you. I need to control my chin too. Yeah, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm gonna. Um, I can't seem to find the link for it. Oh, okay. I'll just. I'll, I'll send you the link here. Just a moment. Or even just go into the little on the screen there. Go. There's a, a cross at the top beside whiteboard, and just a drop-down list comes, and you can open YouTube video. Oh, there we go. Somebody's sent it to us. Thank you. Leah? Okay.
better way of opening that up. Than that. Good. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's watch this. Those I'm just going to turn off my audio here. Thank you very much for inviting, much for inviting me. me. It's hard it's clips hard to follow. Clips to follow. Okay, I'm going to kick okay, off by first, first of all saying that we're into the London we're Games. The I want to introduce you to my world, my world of elite. I think if we turn off all our, our audios, then it might work okay. Sports, we're going back to the ball drum and what happened there. Fantastic privilege to be part of the team that supports these elite athletes. And you probably want to know. What I actually what I did. Actually did. Uh, so I'm going to try and run through about 30, 30 years, years of experience and knowledge, knowledge in about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So we're off. So we're I'm, off. A I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a doctor who's specialising in looking after the human mind. And basically my aim from my perspective is to make you happy, confident and successful people. And that's a tough challenge and there's a good reason. Okay, imagine you're offered a machine. Okay, so you're just thinking, here's this machine I'm going to offer you now. And it's made you really happy. It can give you confidence, success. It stops you from ever being anxious or worrying and removes all unpleasant thoughts and feelings. Okay. You'd say, I assume, please give me the machine. The really good news is this. Start smiling because you've already got the machine. All right? Let the penny drop. The machine is with you. Okay? It's called your mind. And some of you don't know what's going on. In fact, probably all of you don't know what's going on, so I'm going to illuminate you today by saying, look, this is what's going on in your head, and there's a little bit of a surprise with it. Why isn't my mind doing these things? If you say, if it's such a good machine, why is it not functioning? And we've got a little bit of a puzzle here. Let's imagine a Martian came down, and I had a look at this home. It said, there's lots of these human creatures about, and they don't make sense to me. And this is the puzzle. While you're sitting there calmly, you're in charge of your legs, you don't suddenly get someone jump up, run around the auditorium and shout, sorry, I had a leg attack. Okay? That doesn't happen. And yet you sit there with your mind going all over the place, giving you thoughts and feelings that you don't particularly want, and there doesn't appear to be any control. So that doesn't make sense to me. As a doctor, as a scientist, I'm thinking, why do you not have the control over something that's in your head? Uh, so it's a bit of a puzzle. So let me solve the puzzle. You're not alone. Okay? You're not alone. There are two of you in your head. Okay? So let me show you what's going on because someone else is sharing your life and has the power. Let's investigate it. So we're going to start with the tough bit. So I hope you drank your coffee this morning. The brain in conflict. Now, if you're one of the medical students at Sheffield University, where I'm undergraduate dean, I might test you on the end of this. But I'll let you get away with it. So these are the fancy names behind me. You don't need to remember them, but let's have a look at the brain, your brain in conflict. Okay, so what you've got is not actually one brain, but a series of brains that in the womb all start growing as little units and then link in and lock into a brain and cause you to have a lot of problems because when these units get together, they don't always agree on what's going to happen. And the problem you've got with a human brain is this. You've got all these components, and if you look at that brain on the screen, the part which is in the dark yellow at the front, the biggest bit, is your thinking brain. Only the edge thinks, only the cortex thinks. So the rest of it's just a machine. And the middle bit, surrounded by the singlet gyrus and underneath, is called the limbic system, and it reacts. It doesn't think, it just reacts. Now, if that were your brain, you wouldn't have a problem. You'd have a reacting bit that tells you the instincts and drives what to do, and then a thinking bit, which is you saying, well, I'll make a choice now. We have a major problem. The brain didn't stay like that. The little bit in the middle, which is an automatic emotional machine, decided to push its way out to the edge of your brain, and it grabbed part of the cortex and said, I want to think too. So now you've got this little machine in your head that's starting to think for you, but it doesn't think the same way as you. You think rationally and logically. This little bit of brain thinks emotionally and catastrophically. So let's see it in action, all right? You come into college, you come into school one day, and you hear someone say, 
by the way, do you know so-and-so has just said, you're really quite dense. You really shouldn't be in this college. There's something wrong with it. All right? So you think, okay, here goes the brain reacting. Number one brain, immediate shout, kill her. <laughs> All right? Number two says, hang on, hang on, don't kill her. Don't kill her. We have to do it socially aware, so let's do it deviously. All right? Number three is your conscience and guilt that says, hang on, it's in between the two. It's got an impossible job to keep them apart and stop them acting, and it doesn't do very well. It's not that strong in most of us, so it gets persuaded by the other two. Maybe, maybe it's not so bad. All right? Number four says, I'm not interested in emotion. I just want you to give me the facts and the evidence, and I'll just stay calm and logical and collected. Number five says, I don't know why it's all about me, me, me. How about the other person? Let's think of empathy and compassion. Why would this person say this about me? I've got to understand them. And number six says, well, I'll just tap into how bad this actually is and then look at the memory banks and say, what happens if you go and kill someone? And what happens if you talk to them? And what happens if... So these six brains are now fighting each other, and one of them has got to get control. I'm hoping that the laughter when I said, number one, kill them, doesn't mean that's the usual one that gets control. Uh, you have now this massive conflict. It's too complicated. So if I start working with you to say, as an elite athlete, what's going on in your head as you get on that bike in the velodrome? There's too many brains trying to speak. Can we make it simple? The answer is yes. If you look at the neuroscience of the brain, it actually boils down to three teams, and three teams are in your head, and they're all fighting as a team to get control of your actions, your feelings, your thoughts. So let's discover what the neuroscience says about this. Okay? We've got a machine without our permission, grabbing hold of you, giving you emotions and thoughts you really don't want. Anxiety, worries, concerns, trying to please everybody else, worried about what everybody thinks about you. And you deep down are thinking, I want to do this. I keep doing it. Okay? So let me introduce you to that machine. This is your inner chimp. You need to say hello to them. They've been with you since you were born. In fact, they were there before you. You're the intruder. And they're running your life, and you're interfering. You're interfering. So you need to get to know this machine really well if you're going to be successful. Simplified brain, therefore, if we look again, is this. You live in your frontal lobe. That's the main area that you dominate, and you think very clearly. Your inner chimp lives in the limbic system and thinks very catastrophically and emotionally. And finally, the rest of it can be put together, and we'll stick it up for convenience in the prior lobe, and that's just a computer running the system. And it's saying to the chimp and human, I'm here at your availability. What do you want to do with me? So now we understand these are the three components going on in your head. Okay. The problem with the computer is the chimp put lots of rubbish in, so there's lots of gremlins in there with silly beliefs and silly actions to promote its behavior. So they're stacked really heavily against you actually succeeding. Okay, so what we've got are three thinking brains in your head. You've got you, facts, truth, and logic. You've got the chimp, feelings, impressions, emotions, and a computer which is a machine saying, use me as you wish, and the chimp usually uses it first. So you have a choice, human or chimp, how do you know who's in charge? It's dead easy. All you've got to say is, do I want? Do I want these feelings? No, it's the chimp. Do I want these thoughts? No, it's the chimp. And you'll probably find 90% of your day, the chimp's in charge. Okay? So it's time to change it round. First, you've got to recognize who's thinking, which part of your brain has got the blood supply and using the oxygen up, because that's got the power. Can we actually shift it by boxing the chimp with truth and facts and then finally, choosing the thoughts you want. The answer is yes, you can, but it is a skill. Why is it so difficult? The chimp brain is five times stronger than you, so you're going to have to be pretty clever. Okay? He or she wins. They know what to do with you. You have to learn about your chimp and be ready for it. So let's show you an example. You go into a room for a meeting, and you're first in the room, and the people before have left a plate of biscuits. There's a chocolate biscuit and three plain biscuits. So that's the message coming into the thalamus in your brain, and it sends a message immediately to the chimp. You have no choice on that. The chimp gets first bite. And the chimp immediately grabs the chocolate biscuit before anybody comes in and eats it quick. Okay? And then it looks into the... It, sorry, it annihilates you as a human, just in case you try and stop it. It hits you with a brick. It uses up to 30 neurotransmitters to make sure you don't interfere with this action. All right? So that's the way the brain works. Don't blame me. Go higher. All right? So you look into the computer, and then a little gremlin says, eat the rest of them. You'll never get caught. 
All right, so you scoff all of them. You think you've got away with it, and everybody else comes in the room and sees the empty plate. Unfortunately, you then belch, and everyone says, that smells like chocolate biscuit. And so now you, as a human, get the message and apologize profusely. All right? That's the way it works. Your chin packs first, you then calm down, and then you apologize. If you recognize the pattern, we need to do something about it. You can. There's the missing hour I've put in. You can actually go straight to the computer and stop the chimp in its tracks. So if you look in that computer and remove the gremlins and put some autopilots, these are constructive, helpful beliefs, values you hold, such as it isn't important what everybody thinks about me, it is important to please everyone, it is important to hold my morals, then when the chimp goes to do anything, it looks in the computer and stops. So the computer eventually holds the power. So this is quite a complicated system, but if you get it right, it means you can succeed in life. So let's look at what happens with elite athletes. There they are getting on the bike. Chris Hoy and his chimp. Victoria Pendle and her chimp get on the bike. And they have very different thoughts. The chimp's thought will be, I've got to win a gold medal. It's very important. I mustn't let everyone down. The crowd looks big and angry. What if my rivals look bigger than me? I can't fail. I don't want to be here. This is the chimp rattling away, doing what's natural and healthy. The human, however, has got the choice now. So both Chris and Vicky are experts in this. They've got the skill, and they just box the chimp and say, right, what do I want to think? I want to think of process. I'm going to go and enjoy myself and do my best, because that's all you can ever do in life. Do your best and enjoy it. The same for you on the day of an examination. Now, I teach medicine at Sheffield University, and students have to go to rigorous exams. And of course, you can imagine, there you are walking into your exam with your chimp. And it's wittering away to you. I wish I'd revised more now. Why did I keep watching television? Was it so important to see strictly? Well, probably from Vicky's point of view. Uh, but your chimp is rattling away, as students do. You don't have to put up with this. You can actually start managing yourself. You can actually learn a skill that puts the chimp in a box. You are responsible. You can't then say, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't do well in the exam. It was my chimp. It made me watch the telly. All right? That's not allowed. Okay? That's like having a dog that bites someone. You say, well, I didn't bite. It was the dog. You know, you're responsible. You are responsible for your chimp. So don't blame it. Okay? Remember, you always have a choice. You can choose to go through life listening to your chimp, or you can become human and manage your chimp. It's a skill to manage your inner chimp, so you have to practice until you get it right. It's not easy, okay? So when Chris and Vicky got on the bikes, it wasn't easy putting all that hard work into the gym, hard work on the track. It was really going against nature and saying, I'm not going to go natural, I'm going to go unnatural. And that's what I'm asking you to do in your minds. I'm saying, stop going natural because it's very destructive to you. We're really built to live in a jungle, not society. I'm going to say, go unnatural. Turn your mind over and start being the calm, collected human that you really are. And stop being fooled and hijacked by your inner chimp. Your chimp isn't bad or good, it's a chimp. So don't start saying what Vicky Pendleton will ask me, how do I murder the chimp? All right? You can't do that. You have to look after it. The secret is to talk to your chimp, reason with it, help it. Okay? Take care of it, and then it won't cause you any problem. But if you don't look after it, and you're not even aware it's there, you're in serious trouble. You have to reassure your chimp and look after it. Okay, this was a rattle through of what can be, hopefully for some of you, life changing when you start to realize this fantastic machine in your head is there for your use. All you've got to do is start understanding it and then get a skill to operate with it and get to be the person you really want to be. Thank you for listening. I wish you and your chimp every happiness and success in life. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that video. Um, hopefully uh, hopefully it, it makes to you now why sometimes you respond in a way that you never wanted to or never intended to, um, and that you know that it's just quite normal and natural, and, and, and that's actually how we've been hardwired. And, and we're hardwired that way because it helps our evolution. Um, that chimp, provides us with all sorts of vitality. And that chimp also protects us from dangers that may harm us and, and quite literally kill us. Um, and so that's what it's there for. And I'm just gonna use this next slide to just reiterate 
some of those, those messages is that we enter into different situations, competition, uh, team dynamic situations, uh, all sorts of different things. And how we see those, those, uh, those situations, the chimp hardwires us to see them as threatening or potential sources of threat. And when we, when we see these different situations, whether it's our internal feelings about things or whether it's, it's a objective reality outside of ourselves, um, we respond in some pretty characteristic ways. Now, these aren't all the symptoms we would see, but there are many of the sort of the more common symptoms. From a cognitive or mental perspective, it does impact our attention. In some ways, it helps focus the attention, and in some ways, it makes our attention more scattered and chaotic. Um, it often affects our decision making, and and often, in fact, it, we say we think that it might be poor decision making because we haven't collected all the facts that are necessary. It can at times decrease our motivation, our desire, our intensity, our persistence towards the activities that we're pursuing, and it certainly can affect our mood. From a physiological or physical perspective, we know that. When the chimp sees stress, when the chimp sees threat, pardon me, that our autonomic nervous system is turned on and we have our brain flooded and our, our body's flooded full of cortisol and, and other types of uh, processes occur that, that we're all too familiar with. Increased uh, breathing and heart rate, sweating profusely, increased urination and so forth. And behaviorally, we will also notice some characteristics of what we're like under stress, um, maybe rushed and impulsive uh, in terms of our actions. Uh, I'm, I'm a classic dropper of things. I, I tend to misplace things. Um, I put them, I put my keys in places that I would normally put my keys and therefore I can't find them. Um, I drop pencils and pens all over the place when I'm under stress. Um, your typical behaviors might be even more rigid um, and you're less flexible um, and, and you might become a bit different in your interactions. I, I noted that when I'm with others and I'm busy and I'm, I feel under pressure, I definitely get very grouchy and impatient and short with people um, and that's not characteristic in, in most of my interactions. So. This is just sort of a natural thing that our chimp does. But if we want to get control of our chimp, we're really going to focus on a couple of different areas. First, we're going to recognize what are our pressure situations or the situations that we are challenged by. We're going to begin to try to import uh, beliefs into our uh, computer that allow us to reassess the situation rather than it being a source of danger. We really want to see it as a source of opportunity for ourselves, as a challenge for ourselves, as, as um, things where we're going to have great dividends from, uh, from pursuing those pressure-filled activities. And then finally, I want to also um, suggest uh, some, some coping strategies that both in the moment and sort of what I'm going to call long-term habits will increase your resilience, increase your capacity to really embrace these different pressure filled moments because there's no reason why your 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 performance can't enhance or be enhanced under pressure that's for sure so that's where i'm going to take our, our presentation next i do want to say that i'm going to put up a lot of information not all of the information is going to be relevant for you i'm putting it up because i don't know all of you and so therefore i can't tailor this presentation to be specific for you but i really want you to be able to take something important away so i'm going to encourage you to look for the things that resonate with you and that you feel will be most impactful i always think that i've gone to an informative webinar or presentation when i can take one or two things away from it so i think in this next couple of slides i really want to challenge you to just think what are something here that is going to be meaningful for me that I could put into place in the next um, 24 hours that's going to make a difference in my life and then a difference in the way that I see myself as a performer? So 
without further ado. First of all, let's look at the different situations you might find yourself in that coaches would commonly experience as stressful or a source of pressure. These are going to be situations that are going to be both outside of yourself, things like competition. They're also going to be events that are within your own self, such as increased expectations for performance. Um, today I was just sort of journaling this morning about my own stress at the moment and yes I have deadlines that I have and presentations I'm giving but I also have internalized pressures about the quality of that performance and, and the degree to which I really want to be on and have my A game ready in those different uh, things that I'll be challenged and, and tackling. So I want you just to think here is a couple of suggestions from the literature of common pressures that coaches feel. What resonates with you? Maybe you can now take down in some note form or right here in the chat box, maybe one or two uh, different stressors that really are triggers for yourself. So I see, Leah, you've written down athlete concerns and managing your personal time and energy. Yeah, those are, those are definitely common ones for sure. Claire agrees. Organizational management. That is certainly something that's not within our control, that's for sure. It's, it's quite tricky. Personal health. Excellent. So again, this is part of being aware of which brain is in charge. Is this the chimp? Is this what I want? Or is this the human? So now that we've recognized certain situations that either the chimp or the human can overtake, now we're going to look at what the chimp response is. When you are under pressure and in situations and are commonly asking, do I want this, as suggested by Dr. Peters, what does that look like? So some of the, most of the thoughts on here, or most of the, the things that I've written on the slide here are probably the chimp is in charge. But you will see at the bottom here, the last three, increase focus, increase my productivity, increase in determination. Those would be things that the human would be in charge of um, when they're under the pressure. Again, let's just take a moment and just kind of reflect on ourselves. What are some of the responses that I would typically have for yourself?
absent-minded, negative emotions, increased physiological arousal. These are all exactly common. And it's important that we just begin to recognize when we're in that state. Um, you know, I just know for myself, last night I got a bit grouchy with my, my family and it was, it was my chimp in charge. And it, I had to say, oops, I'm sorry, ask for forgiveness and then recalibrate myself. And, and sometimes it's nice to just recognize before you actually begin to behave in a way that you don't want to have to apologize for, um, to recognize that you just simply are under pressure and you, and there are now things that you can do about it. Um, I am mindful of the time, and I, I hope that maybe due to some of the technical difficulties, if you would allow me another 10 minutes, that that would be okay. Because uh, I just want to hit a couple of these strategies. Um, you've already mentioned them in the chat box, some of the things that you're doing. And so I just want to um, also highlight a few other strategies that you might consider adopting and, and trying out for yourself. So we know that most coaches, based on what they tell researchers in the, in the literature, is that they're most comfortable with managing their stress while they're in the moment. They're less apt to plan in advance and, and prepare themselves for the fact that they're going to be under pressure, um, but rather that they prefer to just sort of manage it while it's happening. And so in the moment strategies seem to be pretty important. And these are some of the five favorites that I've come across. And I'm just really going to highlight two for you in this, this group, because I think some of you are already doing most of these. But I just really want to um, reiterate, first of all, I'm actually going to stay right down here in the, in the bottom, pause. One of the things that we've been teaching athletes to do, and I know coaches could use this as well, is to really connect into breathing. You have to breathe anyways, because if you don't breathe, you're probably going to die, um, which I know is kind of a, <laughs> a pretty wild statement out there. But the literature shows us is that if we take six breaths per minute, we actually begin to turn on the parasympathetic system rather than being led by our autonomic nervous system. And if we turn on the parasympathetic para, uh, system, we reduce the amount of cortisol that's flooding our bodies and we're less apt to re react and respond in behaviors that we don't intend to do. So when you feel yourself getting stressed, program in several opportunities to just take a breath. Now, you know, I, some, some people recommend doing this like 10 times a day. Uh, personally, I think that that's a bit difficult to do. Um, it certainly would be ideal, but it, it's, I, I think it's, it's hard to do that. And so I think just noticing and then pausing and what I usually recommend is 12 breaths. 12 breaths is two minutes. So if you aim for uh, six breaths per minute, so it's 10 second breaths, which is really easy, four seconds of inhalation, six seconds of exhalation. That usually is enough to slow you down, recalibrate, and be able to take in adequate information and slow yourself right down. So that might be a quick in the moment strategy that you could be using, just focusing in on that breath. Another thing that has been quite successful with a lot of individuals and clients I've been working with is to change the thought process. In the moment when you're feeling a lot of pressure and you're getting, um, you're feeling like it's a bit chaotic. I always stop and say, what's my win? And win to me is a nice little acronym that stands for what's important now. In this moment, what's important now? Does the athlete need me to connect with them and see their emotion and see what they're trying to do? What's important now? Is my anger, my frustration going to really make a difference in this moment? No. What will make a difference in this moment? What could I be saying? What should I be coaching? What should I be noticing? 
what's important now. And I love that because it is the win. Because you will recalibrate and get yourself where you need to be in that moment. And what's beautiful about this strategy is that you can do it moment by moment by moment. You can redo this many, many, many different times. What's important now? So I just want to emphasize those two. I also have a slide in my presentation today that I really wanted to address and highlight what we could be doing, what are our wins when we're interacting with our athletes in our social interaction situations. Our body language is actually about 85% of our communication. So it's not just in our words, it's in the tone of voice, it's in the stance of our body, it's in our eye contact. And while we're under pressure, we tend to use communication styles and body language that's in the red box. And what's important now is shifting that towards behaviors and things that we could be mindful of in the green box. So listening without talking, making eye contact, Asking for clarification if you really are confused or unclear about what is happening in the moment. Asking questions in general. Smiling. Smiling is actually a relaxation technique. And letting go and moving on. Accepting what is in this moment. You may not agree with it, but it is what it is. Someone. Uh, I was going to ask us to just take a moment and reflect on which mo uh, in the moment strategies work best for us, maybe share a few stories, but given our time constraints, um, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll just move to the long-term habits or the long-term strategies. Uh, one, I think it was Delaney who um, mentioned in the, in the chat box down there that um, nutrition was a key key thing for helping her in doing what I call increase your capacity. And there's lots of things that we could do that increase our capacity so that when the chimp is active and it's going to the computer, the computer rejects the chimp and allows the human to be in control. So I just want to share some of those things with us. And the number one thing that we definitely want to do, and, and please ignore the red circle for now, is this what I call this energy wellness. Um, we all know that we can't expect our athletes to have extraordinary or exceptional performances if they're not healthy. Health is the basis from which we work with. Um, so they just have to have foundation of health and then from health you can build exceptional performance. And that's the same for us. Um, we need to be well. We need to have health. And health happens, and I'm going to put sleep as one of our most important tools. That's often the one we sacrifice first, um, but we now know from neuroscience that sleep is our brain's mechanism for cleaning up all the toxins from all the energy that's burnt through the brain. And we know that um, quite a, uh, most of our fuel source, I think it's around 60 or 70% of our, our fuel sources are actually consumed by the brain. So there's a lot of uh, toxins and residuals that are in the brain from our daily functioning every day and all the decisions and all the thoughts and all the emotions that we have. And sleep is the only way to clean the brain. So sleep is a really important piece of that. Fuel and hydration has been already noted. We all should be moving. Uh, we should be seeking out at least 60 minutes of walking every day. Um, I have my, uh, my little Fitbit to let me know that I'm uh, what I'm doing. Um, I say here some positive distraction is always a good thing. Um, positive distraction includes things like reading and, and watching TV and, and that type of thing. Uh, usually video games, um, drinking alcohol, uh, drugs, those are usually what we refer to as negative distractions uh, just because of the impact that it has on our brains. And then connecting in with our relationships, of course, and enhancing our, our inner circle um, connections as much as possible. 
So we want to really highlight energy wellness. We just want to be well to begin with before we actually can move forward. And then I think the next popular activity and what makes a lot of sense for coaches is to use planning and um, listing for yourself. Most athletes do this very well for their, for their athletes and for their team. Um, they do a lot of planning. And so planning for yourself is also a strategy that you can use. What is it you want to do? What is your intention for the day? How do you want to behave that day? How are you going to set yourself up? Um, I use this question a lot with some athletes What are, or, and, and, and actually coaches. What are three things that you're going to do today that's going to make your day awesome? And then they list three things. So that's what you're looking for in your day. Um, one of the coaches I worked with um, wrote himself a letter before he went to the Olympics, reminding himself of all the things he had done to prepare his athlete uh, and his athletes for their performance. He did this because he knew that in the moment he was going to feel the pull and the tendency to want to um, overcoach. Uh, just as Delaney had suggested, and, and to be more involved in the performance. He wanted to make sure that he knew that he had done everything, and he re kept that letter to remind himself he had done everything. And now it was the athlete's turn, and he could just sit back and enjoy the ride. And all he needed to be was to be himself. That's all that was required at that point. So again, that was very proactive in terms of preparing himself, and he lived that through the entire Olympic journey. The last thing I'm going, well, actually I have two things I want to just finish off on here. First is, if you haven't seen any of Sean Aker's work, I really, really highly recommend this. There's a lot of credence to the positive psychology world in the fact that when we are happy, when we are content and feel satisfied, that we are at our best. We're more creative. We're more willing to persist. We're better problem solvers. We have better attentional focus. We're more deeply connected in our relationships. And to foster this happiness just requires a daily habit of expressing gratitude and hunting for the things that are going well in your life. This is a skill. It's not easy to do. And that's why doing it every day is really important. We know from neuroscience um, studies on this type of work that 21 consecutive day changes the brain. It changes the firing and the wiring in your brain so that you are searching for opportunities and challenges rather than letting the monkey run around looking for all the sources of threat that are going to take you out. This is a really important tool. This is something that I have been personally practicing in my life too, and it has made a significant difference. So I just really want to highlight looking at Sean Aker's work. He's got a few books out. I've got them in the reading list at the end of this presentation, as well as looking for his TED Talks. He has some pretty interesting and fun TED Talks. He's a great speaker. So um, I highly, highly recommend that. And then the last thing that I really want to connect in with, of course, and maybe this is a plug for all NPCs, is that you get yourself a coach. This is what the whole mentorship project is about, I think, is really connecting in with people who have been there, done it, um, that can listen to you, that can elevate you and lift you because you're in a community of like-minded individuals. Mental performance consultants can certainly play a role in that as well in terms of assisting and empowering you. So, um, so I, I would highly recommend you know, scheduling that in as part of just the way you do your business. You have some daily or you have some check-ins maybe once a month, maybe once a week, whatever your needs are, uh, into your inner circle for ongoing support. I feel like we, we're a little bit rushed, um, but I do want you to just reflect on a couple of those advice and suggestions um, and, and maybe record one or two things 
again, that you would like to take away and maybe try it out and see how it works for you. Um, with long-term habits, it means that you have to be committed to doing it um, every day for a, a good period of time before you can kind of reject it. Um, so again, I just really encourage that. Kelly McGonigal, an epidemiology researcher, um, I think she might be with Harvard University as well. I can't, I can't remember she, which university she's with, but if you've, you've seen her work, um, it's been popularized in the last year or two. Uh, but Kelly McGonigal is a, a researcher who has looked at the effects of stress on health and well-being and as well as on performance. And her latest um, ideas and what she's been putting forward is this idea that stress does not have to limit us. Stress will affect the body. There's no doubt about that. The science is pretty clear. But What's even more interesting is beyond the actual physiological effects that stress has on our bodies and our wellness is the perception of what stress can do to us. According to her statistics and the statistics in the US, the mere belief that stress is harmful for both our health and our performance is the 10th leading cause of death. The tenth leading cause of death is simply the belief that stress is bad for us, not the fact that stress does harm the body. So what she's advocating is looking for ways in which that source of vitality, because that's ultimately what stress is doing. It's trying to give us energy to protect ourselves. How can we use that source of vitality to do the things that we are most passionate about and enhance our performance? So hopefully, hopefully this webinar has been insightful in giving you a few different ideas and some strategies to enable you to do that. So I think that's where we'll leave it there. Thank you, Charlene. That was great. Um, I appreciate everybody's patience with the, the technology, but wow, lots of information and uh, Yes, we will have access to the PowerPoint. I'll upload it. And uh, there are the readings that were on Dropbox and the um, uh, YouTube video is on there as well. So thank you again, Charlene. And uh, one of the things I think we'll, we'll summarize some of this and, and send out uh, in the next couple of weeks just for a check-in to see where you are with some of your long-term habits. And uh, um, appreciate your time, everyone. And um, Enjoy your day, and thank you again to, to Charlene for your for sharing that. Wow, there's so much. I'm a little bit overwhelmed with it and just kind of summarizing, but certainly managing and uh, directing our inner chimp to um, ensure that we're creating a good environment for ourselves to, to be the best that we can be as coaches and as human beings. So thank you. <laughs>